Telecast. Don't forget you can listen to the full version of this week's show at telecast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. My guest this week is Leo Perlman, managing partner of one of the UK's leading TV production companies, Fullwell 73. Before I chat with Leo, let's have a look at Fullwell 73's showreel. Recording? Let's go. Welcome to the Lay Lay Show. Go, 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 go. That's not me, that's Justin Bieber. You and I are going up again. It's not gonna go down. No, I'm gonna go Never go against the family. Never go against the family. What are we doing in this car, Brian? I have you. <laughs> Look great, by the way. Thank you. So do you. Will you soon need me? Will you soon be me? When I'm 64. There's the bog, which was the acoustic chamber. I would spend hours in here. I'm with my guitar. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to do it, what's called a transition. of exploring is what humans do. Jane, good morning to everybody in Houston. Great to be with you. Let us pray for Sunderland Football Club and for our city. This was more special than anything that I've been involved in for my whole life. When you can do what you want without somebody breathing over your neck, that's when the real magic starts to happen. Oh, you ready? I keep asking myself that. love for my legacy to be essentially saying to kids just do what you want to do i don't feel worthy of it i, I don't really get it yet but I, do you know what i mean by that no i'm naked from the waist down <laughs> you want to go to that ball yes i was just crying and singing about it like two minutes ago Let's talk about it. Welcome to Telecast, Leo Perlman from Fullwell73. How are you doing, Leo? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Well, it's, it's great for you to join us. Um, really excited in talking to you about all the things that Fullwell's been up to and what you've been up to recently as well. So um, so let's let's kick off. Talking about your background, what we often do on telecast is, you know, get an idea of how people have ended up where they are within the TV industry and how they've got there. So tell us about your career journey, how you've got to be a founding and managing partner of Fullwell 73. Um, it's a great question. Um, and the answer is I'm still not quite sure. Um, I, I never had any particular ambition or dream to work in the creative industries or in TV and film. Um, I liked television and films growing up, but I never had any intention to work in the industry. Uh, so I, I did law at university, uh, knew very quickly I didn't want to be a lawyer, um, uh, proceeded to work in a number of different um, capacities, 
set up a number of businesses, uh, most of which were spectacularly unsuccessful, um, and then pretty much fell into uh, a the idea for a TV show. Um, the only people I knew who worked even tangentially to television were my two cousins, Ben and Gabe Turner. Ben at the time was editing B-roll for television adverts, and Gabe was at university, and I remembered that he was doing um, American studies with a module in film. So as far as I was concerned, those two were the experts in the field. So when this opportunity fell into my lap to, um, to make a TV show, uh, which is a, a long story, uh, they were the first two I called. Uh, they had a, uh, an old friend uh, from childhood called Ben Winston, who was doing the BBC course at Leeds at the time. So with that dream team, um, we, we went ahead and made our first TV show. Right, okay, and originally, and we'll talk a little bit about where Fullwell 73, where the name comes from. Mm. Um, and obviously you're very inextric inextricably linked with Sunderland. Sure. But was, are you originally from Sunderland? Yeah, I was born in Sunderland, grew up in Newcastle, um, left the Northeast when I was 18. Um, so yes, from the region. And so when you met your uh, other founders and mm. started working with them, uh, on a professional level. How old were you then? What, what's what sort of, uh, this is what sort of 2003, age? so uh, uh, I, I was born in 79. I don't know how old that makes me, whatever right. it was. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I'd done a few things until that point, but as yeah. I said, none of, them in, uh, none of them in television or film. And what was that first production? Uh, it was called The Freestyle Show. Uh, it was kind of like Wayne, Wayne's World, but for sport, but with none of the humour um, of Wayne's World right. whatsoever. Um, none of the intelligence either. Uh, but amazing learning experience of how absolutely not to do things. Um, yeah, in fact, one one great story uh, just to share um, of just how just how bad a show it was. Um, we 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 used to shoot it on a Saturday and Sunday morning. Um, it was a live uh, of all things um, kids TV show presented by uh, football, basketball, freestylers, um, kids, talented kids, but from the streets who had no formal training themselves, so much like us. And the four of us would rotate the roles on a weekly basis. So one of us would be the vision mixer, one of us would operate the camera, one of us would be the producer, one of us would be the director, because we were all learning you know, as we went along. Um, and one particular show I was directing, whatever that means, and we went to an ad break and I went, onto the set and I started berating our young presenters. I was like, where's the energy? It's a fucking joke. I don't know what you bothered to turn up for this week. I was really losing it. And my phone is buzzing in my pocket and everyone knows one air. So I take my phone, it's my mum. Put my phone back in my pocket, continue to berate them. It rings again, it rings three times. Eventually on the third ring, I pick it up. I'm like, mum, we're on air. And she goes, I know. I was like, so why are you calling me? She goes, no, no, you're on air. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? You haven't gone to the ad break. Um, that is probably, uh, that, and, that, and that's not like the worst example. It just shows just how appalling the television show we made was. Um, but what that led to was in the hands of the gods. So one of the young presenters, a guy called Paul Wood, he had a dream to meet Diego Maradona. Um, and he had uh, no money to do so. And he came to us and he said, I want to busk my way from London to Buenos Aires to meet Diego Maradona. It'll be my life's dream to do so. Would you follow, a, follow me with cameras? And after much persuasion, um, and he had a group of, 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 you know, boys who wanted to go along on this journey, none of whom had a penny between them, didn't have passports, let alone any money to do so. We went to the BFI, um, whoever it was at the time, and we got a bit of money and we raised some money. We raised about 100 grand all together from friends and family. And we went on this adventure together with these five boys, the four of us and a little crew. Um, and that resulted in the first film we ever made. That went to Cannes. And, and to be clear, when we made it, it really was... You know, if the idea that it was in one cinema, if the idea that it ended up on any channel anywhere in the world on television and that we didn't lose money, that would have been a success. It ended up going to Cannes, uh, being bought by Lionsgate in a very surreal bidding war where we were taken to parties and told all kinds of wonderful things about ourselves um, and released on 80 screens, which was the widest release documentary ever at the time theatrically in the UK. And we stood there on the green AstroTurf carpet at Leicester Square at the premiere. We had asked for a green AstroTurf carpet because it felt like we could ask for really ridiculous things at the time, and it turned out we could. Um, 
And we kind of sat there and looked at each other and we were like, we should, we should do this for a living. Why don't we set up a company? Quite naive. 24 hours later, when no one had been to see the film and it was pulled from those 80 screens, we were left with still this plan to set up a production company. But of course, no one interested in commissioning anything from us. So that was the birth of Fool. Learning on the job, right? And Absolutely. And still am, no doubt about it. Yeah. But those shows, uh, there, there are obviously there's a strand running through those that, that lead right up to now in terms of, you know, a lot of football. Lot oh, thank of God. I thought you were going to say they were bad. I was really <laughs> worrying. That's where you go, Justin. Well, well, let's let's talk about some of your shows. Let's let's talk about... Uh, it's an, it's an incredible list of uh, of credits. The Kardashians, Late Late Show with James Corden, who's obviously also a, a partner of yep. the business, and we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. Some of the specials that you've done in terms of music uh, are, are remarkable as well, in terms of a lot of people have seen the Adele shows, both for, I think it was CBS, was it, in the States, and also ITV yep. in the UK, around her uh, recent album launch. Um, One Direction shows, the Grammys, um, and then Sunderland Till I Die, which has been you know, a big hit on Netflix. Yeah. Um, and So that's what I mean about that sort of thread running through it, the football and the entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, and also feature docs. Um, and uh, a lot of those have th been theatrically released as well. Obviously, a, a lot of success in the States that you've had. Um, what what built that momentum towards going to the states because uk indies that's you know often the dream is mm -hmm. to go into the biggest tv market in the world after you've proved yourself in the uk and um, and obviously got some great commissions with uh with broadcasters and presumably some of this was was almost pre-streaming or sort of pre the modern streaming era era let's say so um so what what led you to opening an office in LA mm -hmm. and and having success in the states what what was what were the steps that you th you think that, that led you to crossing the the Atlantic well going back to the point you made earlier about the I guess the theme that runs through a lot of the content I think in that early phase of full world when we were building the theme that ran through it was really our talent relationships um, and those are absolutely not down to me my partners are the most brilliant creatives but also they build relationships with talent in a way that I've never seen anywhere across our industry the like of. And by that, I mean, they are genuinely interested in having a relationship, a genuine relationship, a friendship with these people. These people, normal people, but happen to be great talent. Yeah, but isn't it Whether just it's, a business relationship? Is that real? I mean, obviously no, it is. And that's, and, that, and that's the difference. The reason why talent so often want to work with Full World and in particular, so often want to work with Ben, Gabe and Ben. They don't want to work with me at all. I'm the guy who has to go and negotiate a deal or whatever. The last person they want to be in a room with is me. But with Ben, Gabe and Ben, they absolutely want to come back time and again because they believe, and they're right, that Ben, Gabe and Ben have their best interests at heart. That the content they're going to create together as a partnership is going to be genuine. It's going to be honest. It's going to lean into what they think is important about how they're presented. And so... There is a real genuine friendship that underpins it. It's incredible how they're on such good terms, how they hang out, how they are on WhatsApp groups with all of these people they work with once and the next thing you know, they're best mates. That isn't contrived in order to get work somewhere down the line. That's not how it works. It's because they really enjoy spending time with them. And I think that's what's underpinned the success or certainly underpinned the early phases of the success. I go back to James Corden as the perfect example. James and Ben met on the set of Teachers when James was 16 or 17 and Ben was 14 or 15, and they were effectively at a kind of similar stage in their careers. Ben was a runner on the show. James was a bit part in the show, small part in, the, in, in Teachers. And they recognised something in one another. They recognised an ambition. They recognised a desire to be successful in the industry. They recognised a similar, I guess, tonality to the kind of content they enjoyed, and they just became best mates. And that led to James working with Fullwell as we move forward. Smithy sketches around the England team as a first example. That was the first time I ever worked with James. Um, and then right the way through up to the Late Late Show and the Gavin and Stacey Christmas special and the huge, huge piece of content and eventually him becoming a partner in the business. But if James is the ultimate expression of that relationship that my partners have with talent, 
those other relationships, whether it's with David Beckham, whether it's with Jack Whitehall, uh, and a whole host of others that I can list, Trevor Noah, uh, the guys from One Direction, but, but in particular, Harry, that James example is the ultimate example of it, but all of those are very similar. So I think the initial theme that ran through our content was talent trusted us. Talent trusted us to do right by them. And we did over and over again. And we delivered content that was genuine and that they loved and they enjoyed working with us. And that's what the business was built upon. No doubt about it. It's interesting you say the, um, uh, the Smithy sketch around the England team because mm. you know so, some, some of those moments that, that also you, you've mentioned uh, have become you know, real mainstays and real highlights of, of, of recent you know, television. Mm. Um, uh, so when it, came, it comes to James, was the the commissioning of his, of the Late Late Show with James, was that the first major project that you had in the States? Or was that, um, because presumably as a, as a director of the business, he said, yes, I'll do the show, but we have to, we have to produce it. Is that how that, that worked? Well, the show was the rationale for opening an office in the US. It was the reason why Ben moved out there to set up the US office. Um, we wouldn't have set up a US office at that point. It was always the intention. In terms of James, I mean, look, you know, I think James has said himself a number of times, so I feel comfortable saying it as well. When he was asked to host the Late Late Show, he was as surprised as anyone else. Um, uh, and it was, you know, incredible credit to CBS in seeing James as potential talent, which, by the way, is no surprise to us. He's the most frustrating partner in that he's just so fucking good at everything. As in, like, he can write, he can dance, he can sing, he can act, he can do a monologue, you know, he can produce brilliantly. He's got such an eye for creative detail. Really, really frustrating to have someone that good. But joking aside, when he was asked to do the show, um, the caveat that he gave CBS, which is insane to look back on now, was that, and he wasn't a partner at Fullwell at the time, was that, well, I'll only do it if Fullwell 73 produced the show. And quite rightly, CBS said, I have no idea who you're talking about. And he said, oh, they're the guys who, and he listed a few things we'd done. And they went, I have no idea who you're talking about. Um, ben uh, and the team went out there and effectively pitched for their involvement, for our involvement. CBS, let's be honest, because they were so desperate for James to do the show, not because they were enthralled with the idea of full world doing it, said, sure. Um, and the guys moved out there uh, with, I think, a very, an, again, a very short-term realistic view. Eh, if we're on air for six weeks, happy days. If we're on air for six months, even better. The fact that it was, you know, ended up being eight years and we ended up choosing to end the show, which is incredibly rare. I mean, normally you're kicked off and instead we were offered three more years and decided that it wasn't quite the right decision at that time. And we had other ambitions and we'd done everything we could do with that show. It's just an incredible testament um, to how brilliant uh, a job they did on that show. But that was that was the driving force behind opening the US office. And then the business out there has built off the back of that, no doubt about it. That must have been a really um, high pressure time, I suppose, when you were going out there and pitching for your involvement, like you're saying, into that show. Because you can imagine, or I can imagine, there'd been some uh, pretty hard nosed American TV execs not wanting a UK indie to, to produce this, really wanting their somebody that they knew and trusted and worked with all the time doing that. So, so but it's a free hit. It's a free hit. There's no pressure when it comes to something that you don't expect to be offered and certainly don't expect to get. And actually, I think that's not a terrible attitude to take more generally. You know, I, you, you can never become complacent or think that you're, uh, or think that you're entitled to anything, deserving of anything. When we got to make, you know, Captains, Captain of the World, the show that was just released on Netflix over Christmas. When you get offered the chance, when you offered the chance, when you win the chance to make the official World Cup series that's never been done before, access to all the captains of the World Cup, as many cameras as you want floating around a World Cup in every dressing room, etc., and for it to be on Netflix. That isn't a right, that's a privilege. So every single time we get to do something like this, that's how we view it. It's a bit of a free hit. I mean, it changes when you've got lots of people that rely upon you to keep on turning over a certain amount to pay the bills and keep the lights on and of course, there's more pressure at that point. But if you ever change the attitude that it's something that's your owed, 
then I think that changes everything about the way you approach it. The Late Late Show was a free hit. It was a free hit when we got it. It was a free hit for the first season of it. And then it becomes more serious. But most shows are like that for us. Look at the Kardashians. We'd never made a reality show before we made the Kardashians. And then you get to make the biggest one on the planet. Of course, there's a massive pressure to that, but it also gives you a freedom. And again, what the team did in reimagining a show that had been on air for 20 years and had become truly iconic and everyone knew exactly what they were going to see week in, week out. And then to have to deliver that brand new show and that opening segment, the opening piece of that new series had to feel different. It had to feel same characters, but it had to feel like something you'd never seen before, even though there'd been a thousand episodes previously. That's a free hit. So you talk about your partners and their ability to work with talent and, and uh, build relationships with talent. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to creativity then, and, and the creativity needed to reboot the show like the Kardashians mm -hmm. and, and also to come up with all of these new, developed, new developments and all of these really successful shows that you've developed. Who's the creative force? within Full World 73, do you, is there one person that, that really leads that? No, that there's not one person. There's a team. There's an amazing team based across the US and the UK. Uh, it truly is a transatlantic company now. Um, we're very much aligned between US and UK, mainly because we sell most of our content to global buyers, um, US studios. Uh, certainly, we still sell to the UK, but the size of the market just dictates that. So no, it is uh, a team of people um, and to start naming them would genuinely mean naming a host. Uh, we have an incredible exec team at Full Well. Um, we have, I believe, some of the best creators in the industry working at Full Well. Um, but it is very much a collaborative effort on every occasion. And is the business truly independent, a true indie? Or do you have investment from any distribution businesses? True or? indie. No investment from any distribution business, any broadcaster, streamer, studio. No, none whatsoever. And is that something that you're keen to maintain? Look, the industry is changing so much on a day-to-day -day basis, let alone week or month to month, um, that who knows what the future holds? And I genuinely mean that. Um, I, I think that the last few years, certainly going back to slightly pre-pandemic and through to now, uh, has been chaotic. Chaotic for the industry, chaotic for broadcasters, streamers, major indies, minor, for all of us. You have to remain flexible. You have to take a view that you're not quite sure what's around the corner, but you also have to embrace that and not be afraid of that. Because where there is chaos, there's also opportunity. Um, and I think that's how we that's how we view it. Certainly, you know, certainly if we look at what Full World was pre-pandemic, you could have definitely described us, I would say, as a transatlantic production company. We made TV and film. That's what we did. The next iteration of truly successful companies within this space, I think if they were to describe themselves as transatlantic production companies in three to five years, probably don't exist. And if they do, they're a tiny proportion of the size of most that exist now. I think the future for us, and I'm not telling anyone else how to run their business, but I think the future for us is thinking ourselves about ourselves as a global content company. The difference being that one can't just look at the two key markets that have built our business, US and UK. You have to look further afield. We're already starting to do so, but we certainly haven't done it enough yet. Um, one have to think about content far outside traditional production, certainly outside of traditional TV and film. Um, the places where content is viewed, as we've seen over the last few years, and this, is no, this isn't an update for anyone, uh, are becoming more and more diverse. Um, and I think we just have to be open to that change and that shift. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this week's show. Don't forget you can hear the full interview on all the major podcast platforms. For more telecast video conversations with the international content industry's leading executives, just click on the subscribe button below.